Warren Sprouse. We're on the Bible Forum. We're here every Sunday night from 8 to 10 p.m. Eastern Standard Time. We're here for you. We're here so that you might learn. We're trying to solve all the problems of the world. We've only got two hours. One of the issues that has come up in, in my world, <clears throat> maybe it has in yours as well, are churches where you never hear anything on the biblical doctrine of eschatology. Eschatology is the doctrine of final things. What's going to happen as we reach the end of the age? Uh, how is all this going to be resolved? Pastor Tom Hughes leads uh, the 412 church. I have no idea what the 412 stands for. Uh, in San Jacinto, California. He's written a, a, an article entitled Five Reasons Pastors Don't Teach Bible Prophecy. He writes that prophecy fills the Bible. End time prophecy touches every person alive today. Jesus taught on it. So did John, Paul, Peter, James, Jude. And yet only a small percentage of churches teach the crucial part of God's message to this generation. Some don't teach it at all, and they don't teach it because of theological issues, reasons, problems. One is they don't believe it. Another is they don't think it applies to us. Some consider all of those things symbolic. Now, the language is symbolic, but it is not a symbolic concept. Others believe that we're probably living near the end of the age, but they don't want to get near that particular topic. They see it more as an elective. <laughs> you can take this course or you don't have to have it. There's other things that are more important. The author continued by saying that's not how Jesus saw it. He actually reprimanded the Pharisees and the Sadducees for not discerning the times. He said in Matthew 16, when it is evening, you say it'll be fair weather, the sky is red in the morning, it'll be foul because uh, what, 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 it'll be foul weather. Uh, you know how to discern the signs of the times, but you don't know how to you know how to discern the weather, but you don't know the signs of the times. You don't see what's right in front of your face. More than 25% of the Bible is prophetic, and much of it has yet to be fulfilled. If you're preaching to a congregation, the whole counsel of God, how can that congregation get a well-rounded picture or understanding of Scripture if you leave out 25% of it. He goes on to list five reasons that pastors may not be doing it. One, they themselves don't understand prophecy, and that's probably true. They fear of offending members in their church. If you start preaching this thing and it's something somebody who is maybe the chairman of the board uh, doesn't believe, He's a member of a church that says it believes this, but he doesn't. You could have a problem. It also is the fear that you might scare people with this, and some of this stuff is frightening. There's a concern that some people might stop giving uh, if they think that we're close to the end. What, what's the point? There's also a fear of looking like some kind of a Looney Tune fringe Harold Camping kind of guy. I would ask, I would ask, <clears throat> I would add John Hagee. He has predicted apparently that August 30th, which is coming up in three days, is when the church is going to be raptured out. He likes to do stuff like that. But when you watch Hagee, what you find is that he spends a lot of time uh, talking about end times kinds of things. He's got charts, he's got banners across the church. I mean, he'll go into great detail, and he's mostly right. But he's got some things in there that are a little strange. The prophecies of the first coming of Christ were all fulfilled, literally. 
and they're there as evidence that the Bible indeed can be trusted. The prophecies of his second coming work exactly the same way, except that we get to witness those events in our time, often with our eyes. Now, in talking about end times issues and events, you begin to run into areas where not everybody agrees. Good Christians disagree on various elements therein. Last week, I was talking about the 144,000 witnesses that will be <clears throat> sealed by God during the Great Tribulation and go about the world preaching the gospel. And as a result of that, I had a, a, a listener, a uh, viewer, from last week who wrote to me. I take that back. I believe he called. I didn't get the call, but I have a system that converts it to print and I read it, or I got an email. I can't remember exactly how this all came about. But what he said is, and I want to read you what he actually said. He said, you stated that the 144,000 is a group of Jewish male virgin ministries, preach, missionaries, preaching a gospel different from the gospel of Christ that the church responded to. That he, they were preaching a works system. You have added to the Bible your theories theories that have no foundation or substance in Holy Scripture. Further, the establishment of the state of Israel is not a fulfillment of prophecy. Jesus Christ emphatically stated to the Jews, your house is to be left to you desolate because they rejected him. He goes on to say that at times you have accurately expounded the Scriptures, but when it comes to the book of Revelation, you are doing great violence to it. The text is not talking about virgin men, it's talking about the church. In Revelation, a woman represents a church, a pure church or an apostate church. I was shocked that you are so far off base on your understanding of this book when on other parts of the Bible you are in line with it. Your reading of Revelation does not conform to the accepted standards of Bible interpretation. Well, I don't know this fellow. Uh, I've never met him, never spoken with him. Uh, but he has clearly found something we disagree on. The Bible indeed points to specific events and circumstances that will be global realities during the Great Tribulation. This is a time when Satan is having his way with the world. The only organized religion on the planet will be corrupt, that is a false, demonic, controlling kind of religious system that may even be called a church. It will look very much like what we think of in terms of organized religion today. But then you, if you pay attention, you know that biblical Christianity is not a religion, right? Religions are organized groups supportive of certain required behaviors. And Judaism, for example, is a religion. In order to be a practicing Jew, one must observe the rituals and the ceremonies. The same is true with Islam. Unless you recite the five pillars at least three to five times a day, you're not following Islam. And the same may be said of Catholicism, all five versions of it, the Roman, the Eastern, the Greek, the Orthodox, uh, the Russian Orthodox, and the Coptics. Unless in their system you are baptized into that church, you can't get to heaven. Not my idea. It's in their writings. It's in their doctrine. Unless you attend confession and receive communion, you risk dying in your sins. That's what religion is. These groups make some concessions, but the laws of the church, as they are officially written, don't. Biblical Christianity, which is the only kind of Christianity there really is, has no rules that anyone must observe. There are tenets, there are expectations, and so forth, but they revolve around what a person wants to do, not what they must do. 
But the reality is that if you are truly born again of the Spirit of God, you will want to. Philippians 2.13 says to the saved person, it is God which is in you, both to will and to do, according to His good purpose, to those things that glorify Him. A Christian deliberately sinning with no remorse, and this is over time, is not a Christian. There are exceptions when a person doesn't know that what they're doing is a sin. They haven't been taught. Or they've had their conscience seared by some false teacher who let told them these holy things are not important. When Jesus comes, when he comes again, the Bible asks the question, will he find faith upon the earth? Luke 18, 8. And Jesus knows the answer, and the answer is not likely. These days of great tribulation will be driven by the false Christ and with his false prophet luring and herding the population into worship of him, not worship of Christ. The infamous 666 corresponds to this time period when the false prophet administers the false Messiah's requirement that all men receive the mark, worshiping him, without which no man may buy or sell. Are there exceptions? Well, yeah. The Bible speaks of 144,000 witnesses for Jesus. Revelation chapter 7 outlines 12,000 males, each from the 12 tribes of Judah, 144,000 altogether. They are young men, they are virgins, and they are sealed that they might not be hurt or killed, and then sent throughout the world to preach Christ. Now, the Bible makes it abundantly clear that no man may approach the Father except through the blood of the Lamb of God, who is Jesus Christ. Under the Old Testament, the shedding of innocent blood had to be done in faith, looking forward. Under law, there were elaborate rituals representing all aspects of the Christ. The temple itself was a picture of the ministry of Christ. In the New Testament, a slain, buried, and resurrected Lamb of God takes away the sin of the world. One sacrifice, never to be done again. It's finished. Old Testament, looking forward to that. New Testament, looking back on that. And then in Revelation chapter 7, we have this 144,000 who go about preaching Christ. What are they doing? Are Old Testament Jews part of the church, the bride of Christ? No. Are those saved during the Great Tribulation part of the bride of Christ? No. That number was sealed at the rapture. Of all believers, true believers, Christians are unique. They are the bride of Christ. They rule and they reign with Christ on the new earth in the new Jerusalem. All other believers will exist in and around this new Jerusalem on the new earth. They too serve God in relation to Christ. They are the only ones described as being sealed by the Holy Spirit. The church serves God as the bride of Christ. These are differences. If you don't understand those differences, you will get confused. You will be hard-pressed to find a Christian in the book of Revelation after chapter three, four, he gets through the seven churches. You don't see any more Christians. You don't even hear the term. It's not even discussed. The bride is an entity who comes back with Christ at the end of the Great Tribulation, having been uh, married in heaven to celebrate 
the marriage supper on the earth, comes back with the friends of the bridegroom, which are all the Old Testament saints, comes back with those that the 144,000 led to Christ. And as a consequence, they refused the mark of the beast and they were slain. The Bible gives a picture of these people beheaded for the cause of Christ. You have to be careful that when you talk about believers in the Lord Jesus Christ, that all who believe are believers in the Lord Jesus Christ. But there are different dispensations. There are different ways God was working this out. In Revelation chapter 14, it's a mention of the 144,000 again. Is this a different 144,000? There's no mention of this group being Jewish, only that they are pure, not defiled in their worship, that there was no lie found in their mouths, that they were blameless, and they follow the Lamb wherever He goes, having been purchased from among men being offered as first fruits to God and the Lamb, an entirely different description from that of the church or of Israel or of the original 144,000 Jews. Jehovah's Witnesses have wrought a significant amount of confusion teaching that there is a maximum of 144,000 witnesses who will enjoy a heavenly hope that is reigning with Christ in heaven. But the people in Revelation chapter 20, verse 4, are Christians. They are the bride. They rule with Christ in the millennium and beyond. Old Testament saints, tribulation saints, apparently live upon the earth during the millennium and in the new earth. Mormons, as an illustration, haven't helped, nor have the apostate groups, all of which have an alternate reality. And it colors and confuses the issue. The 144,000 witnesses are nowhere described in the Bible as Christians, nor is their gospel described as a Christian gospel. They are Jewish males, sealed against any harm, earthly and spiritual, and sent throughout the world to, world to preach Christ to a beleaguered and deceived global population. When their work is complete, they will be taken up. That they are successful is illustrated by the innumerable converts who appear in heaven, many who have lost their heads rather than repudiate Christ. That's the 144,000 I was talking about. 